wanted to enjoy these times together in the dark days of a man called Nehemiah. And it's, uh, he's a very interesting man, as we mentioned last time, which was our first time that this man was going to, is the last historical account found in the Old Testament. And it's very important to take a real good look at this book because of that very fact that we're living in a very similar day. And as we go through this book, hopefully the Lord will over the next couple of weeks, why we will be able to find similarities, some very, very strong similarities of what the people of God at that time were doing, as well as the enemy of God at that time was doing as well. And so we got here in Nehemiah chapter one, we read a prayer yesterday, and this is Nehemiah chapter one. And we're not going to go over all the prayer, but he was confessing the sins of his people. He was confessing his own sins. He's, he, he, he was calling out that God is faithful. And, and, if in, and of course, in the Old Testament, if they did, if they did his commandments, then, uh, then God would act. We find down into the end of chapter, or verse 9, rather, yet I will gather them from there. So I'm going to read the whole verse. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of the heavens, and I just want to stop there. You know, there was work of God that happened some 50, 60, 80 years before this time uh, that he's writing, is that there there were Israelites, or actually Jews, Judah and Benjamin particularly, were brought back to the, back to Jerusalem. And as when they arrived back, it was all burned. It was all scaled back. Everything was just destroyed because the land had rested for 70 years. And so this is important to see. He says, and so they scattered them. Now a remnant, a very small remnant came back. And we can read about all those in the book of Ezra. And so with that, we see here, he says, if, if you bring that, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen. And this topic of a place where he has chosen, this is a prominent theme. You can trace this from cover to cover. You can start in the Garden of Eden, and you can go all the way down into glory. There's a place that he has chosen. And it says, a place that I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. And so his name will be honored and glorified. And so there are, there are there, and I just want to make this, uh, this thing, that point I have enjoyed so much. There's a person and there's a place, and the two cannot be separated. I can go through examples, won't do it right now, but go through examples where some will try to bring forth the person without the place, and then some will try to bring the place without the person. It doesn't work. And so there is a, that we should see this theme common common is where you'll find a place, the place rather, and the person together. It's very important to see that. Now, now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. Isn't that interesting? There is, and this is, I'm just struck with this, and I'd love to have any comments on this as well. Here's a question. Why was Nehemiah, and we're going to get to, he's, well, I'm going to read the last verse, for I was the king's cupbearer. So he, there he is. He's the king's cupbearer there, and he's working, he's working for uh, an employment job or whatever, cast into what he was doing there. He was the king's cupbearer, and yet the people of God had gone back to to dwell and to gather to his name, Jehovah's name, right? Well, why in the world was Nehemiah still there? I don't know, nor do I know why Esther was still in the Persian empire. She could have had the opportunity to go back or more. And and then we also have Daniel. Daniel had the opportunity to go back as well. So it's it's actually, sorry, I wanna recount that Daniel, I don't think had the opportunity to go back. But the point I'm getting at is, is it's very interesting to see we're all supposed to shine in the places where God has us. And here in Nehemiah, and this is one thing I want to bring up, this last verse of the, of the chapter, I was a king's cupbearer. It was a very, very important job that he had. He was there. He, the, the king, had to trust Nehemiah, right? We know why the king's cupbearer was there, right? It's because poison was coming through into the king. And in doing so, the the king had to have a someone taste everything ahead of time, right? And by tasting everything, why there was a trust. He was a trusted advisor that was always by his side, right? 
And so uh, this is very, very interesting that he is the king's cupbearer, very uh, esteemed status from the very inner circle of the king. And as I was doing some reading on this, why the king is one that really becomes reclusive. He, he doesn't have too many people around him for being scared about who may take his life. So anyway, I thought that was interesting is, is he's working for the man, if you will. And you could really say it. he's working for the man. So let's move on into chapter two to see the king interact with him. Nehemiah chapter two. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, so that's what it was, Nehemiah delivered it to him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? You know, <clears throat> interesting thing is, is if you're working in a job and I'm working for an employer as well, it's easy to get our mind distracted on the things certainly that are at at hand, right? And there's the water cooler talk that goes on. And there's people talking about other things outside of work, the sports, the drama, the movies, the whatever it is, right? And yet here, Nehemiah, and I mentioned last time that between the time that he heard from his brethren there in chapter one to this time right here is about four or five months. And during that time, he finds himself in a state of prayer and fasting, and now it's gotten to the point where his employer now, <laughs> his boss, saw that there was a sad countenance. And the king calls it out. Why is your face uh, sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. And let me, let me just say something. You know, there's times in life that sorrow of heart is very, very real. And, you know, when you go through a sorrow of heart and it entails prayer, fasting, there's, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. And I know that there are those that are listening that have gone through times of sorrow. And so it's very important to see that these times of sorrows can produce fruit for the Lord's bearing. It says, verse 2, So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? And this is what's interesting is in today, today, the church of God is in ruin. Yes, there's a church of God. Yes, there, there is, there are people everywhere that love the Lord Jesus, but the church of God is in ruin. And we're going to find out here, and he mentions here the, the, its gates are burned with fire. We're going to find out more about gates. Remember last time we asked, we t- I t- asked, hey, how many times do we read about gates? How many times do we read about walls? <clears throat> well, here you go. The, the gates are burned with fire. There's another time. Gates and walls are very, very important for a testimony. And Nehemiah knows this. Worship had already been established by Ezra. This is not a matter of a practice of worshiping Jehovah at that time or today, worshiping the Lord Jesus. That practice has already been established. But what needs to be established is that preserving of what was brought back, that preserving of what would honor the Lord's name. And so what's going on back there in Jerusalem is not honoring the Lord's name. Nor is stuff what's going on today is honoring the Lord's names. And so that's why having walls and gates are very important as we go back because it's going to show how well the enemy comes in and distracts us. And I'm talking about individually too, having walls and gates. That's a very interesting topic. Verse four, then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. 
And the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, and they may must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city walls, and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Well, just an interesting there thing there is that he he's in prayer for four or five months fasting, and we find there that he finds himself in a situation where the king has just asked a question, and I want to go to a very whoops. I'm going to go to a very interesting verse here. It says I'm going to highlight this. So I prayed to the God of heaven. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Something interesting about this here is consider consider the fact that the prayer that he had earlier in chapter one, that prayer and fasting. That took four or five months. Anguish before God, right? Anguish before God. And here now he's saying, it says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. Prayers can come in little whispers, but prayers usually are preceded by long times of personal time alone with the Lord. And so it is. The relationship with the Lord is so needed, right? That communication with the Lord is so needed is those constant prayers. And there he was praying right to the God of heaven, right in front of the king. Isn't that beautiful? And so he gives an answer to the, the, he gives an answer to the king. Now, if I haven't been praying, if I don't have that communication with God and I'm in a problem and I'm in a pickle and I pray, I feel a little comfortable about this. I may not even think about it, but if I've had long conversations with him, if I have pled my heart out uh, along the way and all of a sudden that situation comes up, yeah, there's that familiarity with God. My Lord Jesus is listening. I know he's listening. I know he, he sees me because I've had long conversations with him and I know he's a man in the glory. So it's a beautiful thing to see that relationship has to be established in order to have these, these little short prayers. And more importantly, we see here that he asks this request and it basically, it pleased the king. He asks this whole, this whole list of things to give me. Give me, a, I need, I need, to, I need these letters to get through. I need letters to get timber, etc. And the king just gives it. Oh, prayer paved the way, if you will. It's a beautiful thing to see Nehemiah's prayer life. And as I said last time, let's count how many times he prays in the book, because I think we're going to see every chapter, or almost every chapter. It's going to have to be almost every chapter. May have a little prayer situation there. And to look at that. So if you're looking for examples of prayer in the scripture, that will be helpful. So he does that and it says, And the king granted to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sembalat the Hornite, I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight this here. They were this is this is the enemy here. We're gonna run into the enemy. So let's go in red here. When Samballat the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. The enemy wants to discourage and doesn't want anyone to encourage the people of God. True? That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to bite and devour. And so to have a man arriving here to seek the welfare of these children of Israel is an important thing. Now, we said here that the, the that Nehemiah comes rolling in, and Nehemiah has got all the horses. He's got the cavalry with him. And just for a point of reference, look back how Zerubbabel, who was the first guy in early Ezra, look back as to how he came across the desert with the company he had, or look back how how Ezra brought his company back, and now look how he came. Nehemiah came. Every man has his way with the Lord in terms of faith. 
those guys didn't have the cavalry and the and the and the entourage, if you will, the royal entourage didn't have it. But Nehemiah wants it, and so Nehemiah gets a the, he he had the sent the captains of the army and horsemen with me, quite a quite a lot probably that was coming with him, and so it was disturbing. The enemy was disturbed because of the fact that they were they were cutting down the people of God. They were criticizing the people of God. We're going to find out things. We're going to find this behavior out as we go along here, as we go along here. So I think it's about it for today. Um, I always appreciate uh, hearing from people um, and certainly any comments in the section are, are helpful, but I continue to pray about going through this. Uh, like I said, a little under the weather and uh, trying to get through this, but I've been looking forward to this for so long. And the principles in the Old Testament are same as the principles in the New Testament. The principles in the beginning of the book are the same as the principles in the end of the book. Now, the practices may change. The principles are the same, okay? It's very important. And so we have to distinguish between practices and principles. And so as we go through Nehemiah, we see a lot of principles, and it's beautiful to pick up the principles and try and apply them to today because we're living in a day, as we said, the people are scattered. The people are discouraged. And Nehemiah is one man that weeps over this. And he knows that God's people has so much more for them. And as I said last time, it dawned on me last time, Nehemiah, you know, he wasn't even part of this thing. Right? He wasn't part, he was younger. And so he, he was just born into the problem. He was born into the problem of Israel, or for, for this purposes, Judah and Benjamin being cast out. He was born in that land. And yet there, there he is, the people of God, his brethren are suffering. And it's like, oh, they're worshiping God. They're trying to worship God, but they're suffering. And so we're going to unveil as we move forward here more of why that is happening. It'll apply directly for us. Well, very good. Looks like it's about that time.